still trying to throw the ball. On first and goal, second and goal. Panicking at third. Fourth, I'm wishing for a month. Welcome to the 510 Huddle Podcast with Coach D Lane and your host Isaiah. We got a great show for y'all today, man. We got we're talking about A B, the Steelers situation. We got Le'Veon Bell, free agency decision. Um, and we're also gonna get into where we think Nick Foles is gonna end up uh, this offseason. Let's talk football. We're here at Laney College, home of the champions. Uh, yes, best junior college in the nation. Um, we got a special guest today for you guys on the 5-1 Huddle Pod. My man, my guy, Coach uh, Dico. How you doing today, Coach? Man, I'm good, man. Appreciate you guys having me on the on the podcast. Man, you guys are doing some big things. Big fan. Yeah, definitely a secondary coach um, and a special teams coordinator, correct, as well um, for the uh, Laney College. I'm sorry to have Coach Dico here. Uh, I think we met a few times before. Uh, you know, like I said, I've had a lot of you know a lot of boys come through Laney. Saw to get this interview and uh, you know hear perspective from national championship winning coach. Um, that's big. So yeah, man. Um, I, I think Deco by far uh, is probably one of the best coaches I had in my career from a teaching perspective. I think you touched uh, touched me really on a, on a teaching perspective uh, and got me into this film a little more than usual. But um, let's try to get into it, man. So uh, one of my first questions for you, how did you get into coaching, Coach? Man, so it was one of those things I kept hearing the theme while back in the day when I was a student athlete that um, coaching might be something that might work for me because I wasn't necessarily the most athletic student athlete that was out there. And so um, I had to find ways to get on the field and contribute. And so the playbooks always came easy for me. All right. It was something that I understood, um, offensive schemes, defensive schemes, things that I was able to – it made sense to me. And so I, I was able to use those, my knowledge of what was going on, to put me in position to make plays. What would you say to anyone else trying to get into coaching, the first, first step? What would you recommend? Man, the, is to learn. All right? The biggest thing is you're not going to be able to pick up – Everything, you're not, you're not going to be able to go day one, all of a sudden you're going to be on Belichick's level, all right? And so you're going to be, you're going to have a comfort zone. It could be offense, it could be defense, it could be special teams, it could be a certain position. You're going to have a comfort skill part that you're going to be very comfortable with. You want to get into it, dig into it, figure out how it really works, and then figure out how it fits into everything else, and then start branching out from there. Because you're not going to be able to pick it all up. Yeah. Okay. You got to start somewhere. What, what would you say to, uh, you know, we've seen the, the wave in the NFL with the Sean McVays and these offseason we have a bunch of 30-year-old hires. What do you what do you think separates them to be young and get an NFL head coaching job than from the past? Well, you know, the NFL is a copycat league, right? And so um, Sean McVay, a very, very special individual. He grew up in the NFL. Not too many people understand that. So, like, the... His grandfather of Pops was, like, the builder of the 70 Cowboys or the Steelers. Which team was it? That might be. I'm not 100% sure on where, but I know he grew up as an NFL kid, an NFL coach. So, like, Mike Shanahan's of the world, the Sean McVay's of the world, they grew up knowing NFL, okay. right? And so their ability to see offenses is a little bit more advanced than those that didn't grow up in the NFL. All right, and so um, for everyone wants that Sean McVay, but some of those other guys that got hired this past year didn't necessarily grow up in the NFL. And so they were, it just happened to be that they hit it at the right time where the Sean McVay's of the world are making it work, and now they're looking for those next innovators, yeah. so to speak, to try to come in and, and try to get some juice into the game. Yeah, that makes sense. Those very unique situations, like, you know, why most guys were playing, they were already in the coach mode at 20s, you know. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Coach, you touched on it a little bit, but um, I got another question for you. Um, and I think I know one of the guys that you might be one of your answers, Coach Bean. Um, who are some of the coaches that help shape, like, the co your coaching, the way you coach? Because, like I said, I think you're one of the best teachers I've been around. So, like, mm -hmm. who helped shape you and mold you into the type of coach you are to this day? Mm -hmm. Well, Coach Beam, uh, John Beam, was, was definitely one of those. Uh, he was my high school coach. Um, he was, uh, he was in a sense, my second football coach. And so before I got to, to, uh, coach beam, 
I'd say one of those very influential coaches that helped me out was my baseball coach, Coach Murphy. It was an Oakland Bay Ruth kid. And so um, he taught me how to play the game, taught, right? And so not just the coach, not just throw stuff out there, taught me the strategy. And so I took that. Um, my ninth grade year was my first year of really playing football up at in uh, Skyline High School. But that, at that point, we weren't, ninth graders weren't on campus yet. And so I'm going from junior high up to Skyline to go play JV. Um, and uh, that was kind of my first experience with football. So from Coach Murph to eventually getting up to Coach Beam, with then my defensive coordinator was up at Skyline. Uh, Coach Cook kind of really taught me how the different blitzes that he had. Uh, I mean, he, he put me in a lot of really good positions to go make plays. And so just being not so much the X's and O's part because he was more on the offensive side. And so I still dealt, you know, he was still the head coach type. But spent more time with Coach Cook, really understanding angles, coverages, things of that nature. And then just beam how he motivates different individuals. Not everybody's the same. Because yeah, so, there's different styles of coaching. That's exactly. what I think a lot of people don't understand. You got, you know, you got your motivators, your motivators, you got your strategic guys, you got right. different ways of coaching. Exactly. Different ways to reach the kids. And so he had a way of figuring out how to push the right buttons for me versus how to push the right buttons for Coach Gardner versus how to push the right buttons for other individuals to get them to be the best that they can be. All right. And so that was kind of early on in my playing days. Those were kind of some of my guys that really influenced me. And then when I got to college, my position coaches, the defensive coordinators I had up there, spent a lot of time with them. And then just watching the game, uh, reading a lot of books. I think I tell today's kids, Coach, this year this year was my first year coaching high school football, and I realized a lot of them don't watch football. And I'm like, right. like I had a kid yeah. in one of my practices with my receiver. I was coaching receivers and DBs. One of the receivers, I was like, hey, line up out there and run a go route for me. He didn't know what a go route was. Right. I'm being so honest, streak, and he didn't know like yeah. the kind of yeah the term, the terminology. I'm like, mm-hmm. dude, like y'all don't even play Madden. I told the kid, dude, right. stick or not. I'm like, that's on Madden. Like y'all don't even yeah. play Madden. Like y'all got the best thing you can do is watch it if well, anything. It's it's especially in today's instant gratification world, right? And so, not too many you probably now not too many kids, young players are actually watching a full game. They'll go quickly to ESPN and watch Sports Center and get all the highlights. They'll see Odell Beckham with the one hand catch and things of that nature. But they're not going to sit through a whole game and figure out why that one handed catch was so big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what led to that? Exactly. Do you think that will lead to more simplified offenses? Like I know, in, like in college, like the spread, everyone's the spread. Um, and during college, uh, at Sierra College, you ran spread. It's a very simple offense. I mean, mm-hmm. it's basically a set of twelve plays ran, you know, different ways. So do you think that is going to carry through college and NFL as a more simplified game because of that? Well, there's, there's uh, at the end of the day, uh, especially at the high school level and then college and then you get to the NFL level, a lot, it's not going to be so much what the coaches know because they're not on the field. And so you got to get the athletes on the field to go make the plays. And so depending on where you're at, high school, you have a limited amount of time with them. College, you have a limited amount of time with them. The NFL – even have a, a limited amount of time with them. And so your job as a coach is to put that player in position to make plays. And so um, the version that you end up giving out to the player might be very simplified because you got to a point where you can teach it in this way, but it still could be part of their complex offense or defense. And so the, the ones that end up being very successful are the ones that can break it down to get that player that just got here to be able to get on the field and run that goal route. What does that go route mean? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And so that's how you get to that point. Um, quick fact check real quick. Um, the John, when we was talking about the McVay, uh, his grandpa is John McVay. He was um, a front office vice president, director of football operations for the 49ers in the 80s. Okay. He presided over five Super Bowl winning seasons. So now th- so think of it this way. You're young Sean McVay. You grew up in an era where Bill Walsh, Joe Montana – other worlds are making their heyday. Where they're revolutionizing the game at that point, to that yeah, point, yeah. right? And so all of a sudden, West Coast offense was the way to go because at that point, before they were doing, everybody was just running out of the eye. It was Big Big Ten football, mm-hmm. right? So they were like, we're going to use angles, we're going to use the whole field, and we're going to take advantage of the way people are playing defense now. And so, and so now that's how you get that young coach that can see it all when you grow up in something like that. That, that innovation. I, I look at. It. 
I, I like how you said like more unique. Well, you know, even uh, Kyle Shanahan with the Niners, he's very young. Um, you know, I mean, for the history of the Bay Area, you looked at John Gruden. He was hired at 33. Uh, John Madden was hired, I think, around his 30s as well. Um, I think it's just very unique situations. And you look at Sean McVay's, uh, like you said, the, he grew up around the West Coast offense. So as a, you already learn as a coach, like, to be innovative from the get-go. I kind of look at any world. Like, you look at, like, the Steve Jobs, the Jeff Bezos. They come from very unique situations. And so, I mean, we're going to see how these hires go in the NFL. But I don't think, you know, you know you're hiring a 33-year-old to lead, man. That's very rare, you know, that's going to succeed. So, um, um, I, I got another question for you, Coach, as far as um, – What's your view on stopping RPO? Because I watched Tony Dungy uh, interview, and he had the best way of stopping it so far from what I heard. And he was basically just saying, press up, play man, inside leverage on the slot, outside guys. Because most, most of the time off of RPO action, it's quick throws, quick routes. They're not pushing the ball down the field. So he's like, press up, disrupt the time of those slants, flat routes, whatever. And they had the linebacker's eyes in on the quarterback mm -hmm. and playing the run game. Yep, and so the 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 uh, explosion of RPO use, right? Some some use it very well. Some don't really understand how to use it, and they they just call and stuff, right? And so what ends up happening, and so defensively, you're always trying to get an extra guy in the box to stop the run if that's an issue with you, right? And so the RPOs play off of those defenders that you put in to run run past conflicts. So if you're telling the defender, typically outside backer, inside backer, maybe in a safety, that, all right, you're going to be responsible for D-gap fill or C-gap fill, but then at the same time, you're going to be responsible for a underneath zone, which one do I put all my eggs in the basket first? So if I'm a run fit player, then if I get run action and I got to fit in the C-gap, that's where I need to be, if that's what the offensive line is telling me. And so... What the RPOs do is, especially if you're playing any kind of underneath zone, cover threes, those kind of things, is that they're going to put those overhang guys into run pass conflicts and play off of what they give them. So the best way to take that away, like, like Coach Dungey was saying, is, is typically if your run fits and your coverages don't match and you're going to leave open holes like that, then they should be able to take those five, six, seven-yard gains every time. right? And typically the RPO game is typically – going to be some kind of slant, hitch, smoke, because anything longer than that, they should be calling more flags on it. Now you're getting linemen downfield that are run blocking, yeah. all right? And so that's – that's you want to tighten up the coverage on that. And so you, you make it of, uh, all right, if you're going to go RPO, it's got to be over my head instead of in front of me. I mean, uh, thanks for the insight. I mean, I feel like that's just a, a tricky, you know, going to next year. And like you said, NFL is a copycat league. You know, we've seen it with the Wildcat, mm -hmm. you know, everything. So – um, I think that sums up the interview. I mean, I appreciate you coming through with a mm -hmm. unique insight. Appreciate the time. Um, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, so AB, man, he wants, he's trying to force a trade out um, with the Steelers. Complicated situation. You know, he, he's going to be a 31 year old receiver. Uh, he's a $20 million cap hit. And, you know, he's basically forcing his hand out with the Steelers. Uh, he, you know, I don't think the Steelers want to trade him. I mean, you see the stats. They're unbelievable what he's done the last five years. Um, so what do you think is the most realistic trade, you know, place he can go with that cap hit? And, you know, who's gonna who's willing to trade for him? For A.B., correct? Yeah. With A.B., see, outside on the outside looking in so far, it seems like he, he wants to force his way to San Francisco. And uh, I'm not really big on Jimmy G just because I feel like I haven't seen him hold up for a full season yet. I feel like he got, and I feel like I haven't seen him take like that shot and be able to keep playing in the NFL game. So um, with him, I just don't see the fit really in uh, San Francisco, but that's where he's pushing to go. With me, I would like to see him in Green Bay. I doubt they got the money for him because they gave a uh, back the uh, Brinks truck for uh, a Rod. But uh, I think I think he'll be nice in that offense. And on the other side, uh, Devontae Adams, I just would like to see that uh, duo go to work together. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Coach Dico, what do you think? Man, it's a uh, very interesting situation with him. Um, heard speculation on some of the things that were going on there. Uh, with a player that is at that age, you're looking for a place that you can kind of go to kind of submit what your legacy is. So 
what you're looking for, you're looking for somebody who can get you the ball. You don't necessarily want to go somewhere where you're dealing with a rookie quarterback, a second-year quarterback, somebody who doesn't really know how the NFL works yet. And so um, you need to go somewhere where you can be featured, where you can help, where you can be the difference maker. San Francisco would be a good place. Green Bay would be a great place. Seattle would be a good place. Man, All he these never type. had no big, big like he never yeah. really had big either though. And so, I was gonna say he never really had no big time receiver during this Pete Carroll. Right. Besides I love, Doug, I love Doug Baldwin, but you know I'm I, talking about I like love that five, Seattle top. fit. And, you know, I, I think, think Seattle, Seattle would be a great fit. I think just because you know Russell never had that real. Don't get me wrong, Doug Baldwin is, is a good receiver, but he's I not. I said about top fifteen, top twenty. Yeah, no, definitely. But you know, he, you know, he's never had that 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 dominant number one receiver like yeah, okay yeah, he's top five he's top ten yeah. so I mean I think Seattle that's a nice fit the, I think the problem is is we have a cap number that's that big you know 20 million he still needs that for three he's on the deal for three more years so you got him locked up and he's 31. 30, 30, 30. so I mean if you see Antonio Brown I think he has the game that he can last long and play 35 you Me know too. and be dominant a but it's just it's going to come down to what team is going to want to take on that cap hit mm-hmm. and the Steelers traded away Martavis Bryant for a third round pick, so you know they're looking for at least a one or a two. And that's the that, that was a question I was going to ask you. Do you think he depressed his trade value? Because they're saying now a lot of people, a lot of analysts I've been hearing on TV saying he AB's not even worth worth the first round pick. I was like, for real? Well, the, the NFL is is not a choir boy league, right? It's a league of typically a lot of second chances, right? And the the more you bring to the table the more chances you're going to get, right? And there's going to be someone out there that believes that they could be the one that can kind of get you going in the right direction. That's part of it. It's just part of the game. Just, there's always, you might not be corner-wise, DB-wise. You might not be a good fit in this situation, but there might be somebody that loves you in college, thought that you might be able to fit in their situation over here. And in some people's mind, they feel like, oh, that person, they overspent for him. But in that person's mind is a great fit for him. And so when you talk about dollars and cents, part of it, A.B., if he wants to get cashed out, then he's not probably going to go to a situation that has a veteran quarterback. He's going to go somewhere where they're going to need to put some people in the stands where he can get some more money. But if he wants to build on his legacy, he's going to have to maybe take a little bit of a pay cut now to maybe get back into some endorsement type thing at the end of it when you get the rings. A, a team I'm thinking about that could trade for him. Who, uh, who, you, who you saying? The Colts. I was just about to say the same team. Oh, there you go. I knew because they got some money. They, I, they, the got, they got a lot of yeah. money. And him on the other side, T.Y., that... I was thinking that's the team with the most luck. cap space. Yeah, I just thought about that. Yeah. Yo, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's a tricky situation because he has to be traded. He's under contract. So, I mean, the Steelers could just say, I don't think they want the Le'Veon Bell situation again. So, I think he will be traded. But I'll, they're not still aren't in rush. I don't think we're gonna see anything maybe up till draft day. What do you guys think about the dynamic and the relationship relationship between him and Big Ben and how it's all spilling out? Cause I think AB had a point as far as cause I've seen <coughs> Ben finger point a few times here and there in the media and publicly. But I, I just feel like with him getting on social media daily, he's kind of shedding the light away from Ben and like putting it all on himself. And it's like wh- whatever point you was making, you kind of like. Destroying it at this point. I mean, if we look at it, I don't think – I'm just looking at Big Ben as a person. Well, you know, he's had two sexual assault cases against him. Um, I just look at him like he's not as a good person. I mean, nothing put – I mean, he's a, a great player. You Probably know? more so, but not a great leader. Yeah, I think so. I think it's just his ability. He's always had talent around him. I mean, we go back – Yeah, when he came to the league, great defense, run game. He had Antonio Holmes, Plasco Burris. He's always had great receivers. The list goes on. Matavis Bryant, Emmanuel Sanders, Antonio Brown. Mike Wallace, like, he's always had great receivers around him. So I feel like, you know, in Pittsburgh, they're kind of just, the players are kind of fed up. You don't usually hear players speak up for Ben Roethlisberger, anything like that. So I think it's kind of just, you know, it's QB league. We have to do what the QB says, especially a star QB. And, you know, players are getting kind of tired of it, you know. Man, it's a, it's a messy situation. We've all been in locker rooms before, right? Um, there are certain ways that you should be able to handle things. The good teams, the teams that tend to be successful for a long time, you tend to not hear about those type of issues. The teams that have a little bit of a run, maybe fall apart, those are the types of things that you tend to hear more so of. They come out. Right. And so when you are 
the which is weird because the steel organization is normally a pretty classy organization, right? And so at this point, you know, is it one of those things where the players have gotten a little bit too big and maybe it's not just an, an Antonio Brown thing? Maybe it's a thing that they need to break because, I mean, they also got a running back that was holding out. They got quarterback issues that he coming out and saying certain things. And so it could be one of those things where maybe it was a good run and maybe we got to blow it up and start over. I think that's I think, that's, <laughs> I think great, that's the route they're going. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, they didn't make the playoffs last year, and this is, you know, a business where what you're doing now doesn't matter what you did before. So, um, I mean, I think you brought up Le'Veon Bell. I think that leads us to our next point of, you know, with the Le'Veon Bell situation, he is a free agent, so, you know, he doesn't have to wait on trade. Where do you think he ends up going? And I think this is, a, you know, tricky because i just seen in the news, uh, I believe he's up 260 right now. He weighs 260 oh. pounds. This yeah. came out. So Adam Scheffner, I believe, tweeted it. So, I mean, what's your thoughts? Where do you think he'll end up? Oh, you can go first. Man, so uh, you the, always want to fact checks. And so there, there's, there's, there's a lot of people out there that just get paid to put stuff out, right? And, there, and then in some cases, there's, there's almost whole companies that are just paid to just put information out. Could be wrong, could be right, it doesn't matter. And so with, uh, with Bell, there's probably going to be three or four teams that are going to be very interested because he brings certain skill sets to the table. He's a uh, tailback that can play all three downs. I think he's the most complete back. That, you can, yeah. that you can also put out and run some routes. Mm-hmm. Now, the downside of that, though, is that you're also playing tailback in a league where you've had first-round draft picks that do very well, very good things, and then you've got guys that are um, six, undrafted. right, undrafted that come in and do and put in just as much production, yeah. right? And so it's a it's one of those rare positions like a quarterback where typically it's really one guy that kind of does it, but you got all these different colleges that, guess what, they got a guy, yeah, <laughs> right? And so that guy just graduated or he's leaving, and so – they could bring something to the table, right? And so you could go the you can. I've seen it multiple ways in the league where you can go first round draft pick way, get the production, and I've seen the street guy come in and do the same thing. And so now you, how much do I want to have tied up in this position? How yeah, close how am you, I? How you want to build your team? Yeah. Right. See, I'm with you on that. I remember uh, uh, my coach from high school, Coach Peters at at Mac, said, you know, the running backs are the whores of the NFL. You can always find one. I mean, I think we look at look, Todd Gurley got the big money contract. When I got to, who, who was running the rock in the playoffs? CJ Anderson, and yeah. he came off the street. So yeah. I don't, I don't believe in, you know. CJ, you know. Yeah, he, well, hey, shout out to here, Laney, man. shout out to Laney. Well, you know. He saw what he was doing, handling business, and he was low, low, low cost money, and you got another guy making multi million, not effective, you know. So I'm not, a, I'm not a big running back guy. When See, you now you making me feel some way, some way. Like, you know, I played running back in high school, bro. So I feel like you devaluing that position. That's what my high school coach told me. I feel like they, they kind of come a dime a dozen, but you can't, so. you can't over, overrate the value of a complete running back. And when I say complete, it's only a few of them. I think we got the Le'Veons, the Zeeks, the Saquons, the Todd Gurleys. Those guys. You can really lean on them, especially this year. I think we've seen it in last year a little bit in the playoffs and Super Bowl runs for both teams and all playoff teams. Is it still comes down to being able to run that ball and play some defense in the in the um, I, I, in the late stretch, okay, stretch run of the game? You. I think Gurley's Seasons. Gurley's the perfect example. You're one tackle away from not being as effective, right? And so um, I'm gonna take you back to high school. I don't know if you remember high school when I came calling, talking about. Uh, needing athletes to go and stop those running backs. That was my pitch to you to get you to come over and play defense. And so I love the running backs in high school because they show how athletic they are, right? But then those guys that you can put the ball in their hand are also very good defensive players, right, at the same time. And so it's just one of those things that, I mean, you can, you're one pile away from not being as effective. Yeah, I think you made a great point. I, I look at it like you listen to those guys, right, say Quan Barkley, what the Giants weren't in the playoffs. Um, you know, look at you look at Zeke. You know, they won their one playoff game. Um, he wasn't effective in the game they lost, the Cowboys. Him and Dax, two out of what three years they've been yeah. in the league. Two out of three years they've been in the league. They went to the playoffs. They was leaning heavily yeah, on Zeke. Yeah, because I'm just saying. But why the Cowboys? I believe they're set up for success. Their old line. Yeah. Zeke is a good running back. He's blue chipper. Mm-hmm. I mean, I definitely I, I want him on my team, but I'm on him right now because he's cheap. You know, he's not. I'm not paying. I don't have to give him the big money. I'm not giving Le'Veon Bell twenty million dollars. 
Because to me, a running back. Just think look of, at the, who just won a Super Bowl. Think of exactly. That's a great point right there. But think of one of the best running backs of all time, Barry Sanders. Yeah, no ring. Right? Couldn't wiggle his way out of any situation. Couldn't rig- couldn't wiggle his way into a Super Bowl ring because it's such a team game. Yeah. Right now, not too many people are going to pass up Barry Sanders. No. <laughs> but, yeah. but as much of a talent that he was, great highlights. He still needed a lot of help to be able to host that trophy up. I, so for, what about team destination? Since we was talking about yeah. Le'Veon, which I, I got Eagles, Jets, and uh, Packers. I can only see I can see Jets. I got the money for them. I, just because for the money, and I think they've already stated that they are interested. Um, and I just pulled up here, by the way. Le'Veon Bell's trainer said he is not up at 260 pounds, 260 pounds. So it could just be a story. Who knows? You take a year off. You're going to gain some yeah, weight. I mean, we know, and he's we already know. a naturally big back. He's like 6'1", yeah. 6'2", 225. And everyone that plays football knows two things happen when you stop playing. You either shrivel up or you gain weight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, But I, I think the Jets, to me, I, I feel like it's the only real situation I could see them because they're a bad team. They have a lot of money to spend. You know, They're not one player away. Le'Veon gives them some type of offense, helps Sam Darner out. Um, I, 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 I don't really see a huge market for him, you know. Right. What about the Packers? Like, I don't think that plays between him and, and, and Rodgers. And so I, I, I was just about to say uh, I'm going to go more fantasy with it, but I'd love to see Le'Veon Bell and Aaron Rodgers in the same backfield together. That would be some problems. Yeah. Now, I don't know cap-wise. I don't know what. Back, huh, right. He, I mean, he's not really. Not, not really. They've, yeah. they've tried to piece Millen. And so, you know, as we, we talked about the running back position, for some reason, that's the position they they haven't yeah, really been on. able to get right, yeah. and so that would be a good fit for them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, I think we'll see when free agent hits. You know. I think uh, they freaking turned the receiver into running back. Cover, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tom Montgomery from Stanford. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they had and they also had uh, the running back from Bam and Lacey. He had a good first year. I like Eddie. He Eddie ballooned blew up. up. Yeah. He blew up. Oh, yeah. Two sixty, two seventy eight. Yeah. He couldn't. I mean, he couldn't say no to donuts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, Nick, who, I, who we got right here next? Now, now we got Nick Foles, you know, where he's going to go. I think he has the most complicated situation because the Eagles can franchise tag him and trade him, but they have to eat that salary cap. Yeah. But you are getting, which is going to be around $22 million or $25 million, they have to pay him, even if they trade him. So they're like, okay, they'll eat $25 million and trade him for some picks or just let him go in free agency. So that's the tough, I think, real tough position for the Eagles. But I think Nick Foles, I think if I'm him um, – I'm looking at the Jaguars, you know, yeah. as a free agent or even as a trade partner. I, I believe, you know, they have pieces where they are a QB away from, you know, being a 10-win team. Me, personally, I got the Jags down. I got the Giants. And Giants was real good when I had, if they didn't draft somebody, um, like the Haskins kid or Murray or something. But the third team I got down, I'm starting to settle in on this, man. You guys know I'm an Eagles fan. Um, and I think I played a game of Madden the other day, and it really solidified it for me because I had to put Carson on the bench and put Nick Foles in the second half, bro. <laughs> no, he, you know he's it, not staying in Philly. Yeah. I know he's <laughs> not, and it's just at this. But I think the, I'm looking at it. I think Brett Favre told Doug Pearson, "You should go with Foles." I'm just looking at it. I don't know what it is about our offense. It just flows better. And I love Carson. I love Carson. I love him when we got him since we had him, but. He's kind of injury prone, but it's something about the offense. It flows, and, it, and the ball gets distributed distributed around better when Foles is back. Now, I just think he got a quicker release. I think Carson tries to hold on sometimes and make things a little more difficult than what they need to be. Mm-hmm. It, the, that Philly offense was definitely different when you had the different versions of those quarterbacks in. I don't know if it was a play-calling thing where they're now um, calling uh, – things that are a little bit more comfortable for Foles versus when Carson was in. Maybe they had a little bit different versions of the playbook. Yeah. Um, but when, when you're dealing with, with Foles, Jacksonville would be a good fit, um, would be an ideal situation. I don't know if the money at all works. Would be Washington Redskins would be a great fit for him. Now, that's in the division. I don't know. If, oh, we can't let him go. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 that's why I didn't really want to give him away to the Giants. But I think he's at that point where he's going to be able to sign where he wants to go. Yeah. Now, depending on, again, now you're going to see what is important to him. Now, he can probably go to certain teams where he can get a lot of money to do that, or he can go to a place where they're going to really need him. All right? And so I, 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 it's hard for me to – go past Washington at that point. Their quarterback, they don't have one. The second place I would think would then be Miami, new head coach. They're trying to figure out a new identity down there. Now, 
Is he their cup of tea? Who knows? I, I like Miami only because Flores their head coach, and he watched Nick Foles beat him. So I can see that as definitely a fit. Flores like, let me need QB. Let me go get me Nick. So you guys are Peterson, and you had the choice. Who you going with, though? I have to Moving go. Moving forward. I, Including all factors. Okay. I look at it like this. Nick Foles, that's your, uh, that's your standard. That's your Toyota and Honda. You know, it's good on gas. You know, it's going to last long. It's going to get you what you need to do. But you got Carson Wentz. He's that Porsche 911 in the garage. A little more tune-up, you know. Not always dependable. Things, yeah. But if it's going right, oh, it's, it's going right. So, I mean, if you look at it like that, you know, I, I don't see Carson Wentz. We, he's, he's a rare talent to me. So if you think he can't stay healthy, which he's never been healthy, not in college. I think they said in high school. So that's the big question. If you feel like he cannot be healthy moving forward, I would, hey, I'm getting a first, second round pick and going forward. But it's so hard. That's why I was thinking. Try to get some assets. Try it's to, hard, though. Yeah, it's hard. But, but, that's so a tough decision. You're, you're at that point where you, uh, with Peterson, you went all in on Carson Wentz. That's why you drafted him there. Right. And so, right. And so um, that plan hasn't changed. Now, granted, when they went to go win that Super Bowl, um, that offense was doing very well until Carson Wentz decided that he wanted to play a little bit of running back and try to go score that touchdown Mm -hmm. and got hit by two guys in L.A. And now all of a sudden it was all bad. Right. But there was it was doing some very good things with him in there. Right. And so. Um, you went all in with him. I don't see why it would change. Even though Foles did come in and kind of routed it out and got you to that championship, that was still your guy, right? And so you can't have two guys. You got to at one point you're gonna have to decide on which one you're gonna want to go with. And you initially built it all around him. And so I don't see it changing unless he. You just don't think he's gonna be healthy at all. Yeah, that's the, that's <laughs> the biggest factor I think. Um, so we'll see. You definitely coming up with that. So. I mean, Coach D Lane, you got any more on your boy Foles? Uh, no, nah, man. I think that's it. I have uh, a couple questions for you, Coach, real quick. Give me your top three corners of all time, and then give me your Ooh. top three safeties of all time. Top three corners? Corners, and then safeties. You got to separate. Ooh, top three corners of all time. Deion Sanders, number one. Um, now. Might not be the most popular picks on the next couple ones, but Deion Sanders, no-brainer for me. My next two is where, you know, I was a big Aeneas Williams fan okay. back in the day, right? And so he was a little bit, of, you know, not as praised, but that was a guy that I ended up watching a lot, and he did a lot of good things, okay. right? And so um, not so much the guys that necessarily are playing right now, I would say kind of kind of back in the day type would Definitely enjoyed, right, those types, right, the Dale Greens of the world, those types that really went in and, and, and really, you know, did really good things back in the day before the ESPNs really blew up. All right, and so I have no problem with, like, Deion Sanders and Ian Williams, Dale Green types, okay. one, two, three. Okay. Right now, safety-wise, man, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I go Ronnie Lott, number one. Um, my second one, and really pushing Ronnie Lott would be Ed Reed. And my third one, this is back in the day when you were allowed to really hit some people, would be Steve Atwater. Okay, okay. I like Steve, <laughs> Steve, 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 Steve. I, I like your corner picks. I feel like one corner gets underrated a lot. Awesome. And maybe I'm old, old. maybe I'm younger is Champ Bailey. Champ was Champ. nice. I love I watch cover, I love watch. cover Champ, wise. Yeah. I think he was that you know, he was that I think kinda that new age corner mm-hmm. in the passing league, like, okay, I'm really covering. Um and then like Dale Green, Dion, I think Dion you got Dion right, prime first. Time. Charles is one of my favorites, but I know he, he has some both. down. So, yeah. so I Char- know Charles has some so, down years, but Charles is that twinner because he he played both. Right. That, but that, I love him as far as the all time is that, DB. Charles to me is that the perfect uh, like far as he he has the the playmaking skills and the IQ. You know, because Charles even said like you know my technique was never the best. Yeah. It was you know I think it was mm-hmm. more him like he's. He's a freak, I believe. You know, only on my last defensive Heisman. You know, that's different. I think. Yeah. Um, gotta be different. Yeah. I'm surprised you put Sean Taylor in the top three. Well, you know, Sean, man, Sean was Sean was special. We didn't get enough Sean. Yeah. So you think of him more like it's like how we think of like Bo Jackson? Like we just couldn't see the four. Probably, yeah. right, probably. And so I mean, they when they were when when they were on the field, you knew, yeah. right? And so uh, we were just not able to see both of their talents. Uh, for different reasons, kind of keep going and be able to bless that field like that. But, you know, Sean Taylor was an animal. Uh, Safety-wise, we're getting into Brian Dawkins' other world, Troy Palomalu's, right? I mean, so you got you got some guys, right? And then, like you say, Champ Bailey's of the world. 
put Darrell Rivas in, in kind of in there, um, kind of on that level. And so, I mean, you had – there's been a number of guys that have really kind of took those positions into different directions. No, I believe. I mean, as a Raiders fan, I remember, oh, you know, I didn't watch them, but definitely, you know, the Lester Hayes, the Jason Tatum, so those, those are animals right there. All right, close it out on this. Can you give me one for corner and safety of the current game that you like watching? Ooh. And I can't really give a corner. I just know my favorite DB right now is just yeah, Tyrone Matthew. That's my favorite. Yeah, just, like, you know, you know, safety you know, because we're trying to turn the ball over. You know, my yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're trying to get that ball back. I hear you. Yeah. I hear you on that. So, uh, safety-wise, man, there there's some young – go-getters at the safety position right now yeah. and uh i would have to say the guy that i would love to that i just enjoy watching is uh a young guy out of uh new york jets adams is adams is a dog and so he's been he you know i, I his, 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 his first year i was like okay he kind of but that second year he kind of took it to another level and so he's kind of that that box kind of safety, you know, James, the kid out of uh, with the with the Chargers, he, you know, he's kind of in that same mold. They're both alpha dogs, mm-hmm. both really want to get after it. Um, those are two guys right there, yeah. safety wise, that are pretty that, that I look forward to kind of seeing progress. Um, corners, man, you know, you got um, Ramsey when he decides what's important to him. You know, sometimes he's good to watch, and sometimes he's just a bad interview, and so you never really know what you're getting with him. <laughs> Right, but you know he does some good things, um, and so yeah, though I'd say those are kind of the younger guys that. Those are definitely good picks. I like that. Thank you for tuning in to the Five on the Huddle podcast. That sums up this week's episode. But last but not least, I would like to give a shout out to this week's trivia winner, to Jose Contreras. Uh, I'll be dropping off the card to you personally. Um, I know Jose from high school, so thank you for uh, liking, commenting, and subscribing to the podcast with the right answer. Um, this week's trivia question for a free gift card will be, how many draft picks did the Minnesota Vikings trade to the Dallas Cowboys for Herschel Walker? Again, how many draft picks did the Minnesota Vikings trade to the Dallas Cowboys for Herschel Walker? Uh, we got the draft coming up, and so this, you know, we got a lot of we might have some crazy trades, you know, with Tony and Brown. Who knows? Um, and so that was one of the more you know crazy trades in recent memory. Again, if you go to YouTube channel, like, comment, subscribe, and get the answer correct, me or Coach D Lane will drop off a Visa gift card to you personally. Thank you. And remember, next week, episode four, we got another special guest for you. Still went for it. Change the club. Know what the fuck I'm gonna say?